Welcome, we're going to be discussing how to perform a renal ultrasound. And the reason we're doing renal ultrasound is to look for the presence of obstruction. And by obstruction, we're looking for the presence of nephrolithiasis and renal colic. We're looking for the presence of hydronephrosis. And this allows us to make an indirect observation of nephrolithiasis and kidney stone in transit, causing obstruction leading to hydronephrosis versus other imaging modalities where we may directly visualize the stone itself. What we're going to do is we're going to scan the unaffected or the non-painful side first to get some of our baseline depth and gain settings and to recognize what the normal anatomy for that patient is, and then we'll scan the affected side. We're going to obtain a sagittal and transverse view of the kidney on both sides, and we're going to obtain a sagittal and transverse view of the bladder. We'll also be able to evaluate for the presence of urinal jets when we look at the bladder. We're going to use a curvilinear or phased array on abdominal preset, which means the indicator will be pointed towards the patient's head or right side. Or if we're doing a transverse view, the indicator would be pointed in the anterior direction. So we're going to start off with a sagittal view of the kidney. We'll assume that the right side is the unaffected. Sagittal view, right upper quadrant, coronal view, indicator towards the patient's head. And we're going to obtain a transverse view, and the indicator will be pointed anteriorly as we image through the kidney in a transverse plane. Then we're going to scan the affected side. Once again, a coronal view in a sagittal plane of the kidney with the indicator towards the patient's head. Transverse view of the kidney, indicator towards the anterior surface. Then we're going to obtain a sagittal view of the bladder, indicator towards the patient's head. And then a transverse view of the bladder with the indicator towards the patient's right side. And we're looking similarly, like in our fast view, where we're looking for the presence of the liver and the kidney. We'll also note the presence of Morrison's pouch, the spine, the diaphragm. On the left side, we'll note the presence of the spleen, the kidney, the spleenorenal space, and the spine. These are similar imaging planes to what you performed in the FAST exam, looking at the right and left upper quadrants. However, now, rather than focusing on free fluid in the potential spaces, we're focusing on the kidney itself. One thing that may be a little different from your FAST exam is that we try to remain parallel to the bed and perpendicular to the patient. To image the kidney, because it is slightly oblique, we may have to angle the probe. So the superior portion of the probe in the coronal view is angled slightly posterior compared to the inferior portion of the probe, as demonstrated here to get a sagittal view of the kidney. And what we're talking about here is a sagittal view of the kidney, and you see the probe is slightly angled. We can see the spinal stripe in the background, but we're getting a sagittal view of the kidney and slightly oblique on placement on the patient. Now, as a patient is breathing, you will see that the kidney does move in a cranial caudal fashion. Now, the problem is, as you're scanning from anterior to posterior in a sagittal view of the kidney, as a patient is breathing, the kidney is moving in a caudal cranial direction, and you're scanning from an anterior to posterior direction. Now, with the movement in two planes, this becomes very difficult to evaluate the kidney as you are acquiring the image. So what will help is having the patient hold their breath. They can either take a breath in and hold it or breathe out and hold it, depending on what will move the kidney out from under the rib shadows for you to evaluate it. So this is the same patient that we imaged earlier. Now with a breath hold, and you can see the kidney is quite stationary, allowing you to scan through in a very organized fashion. Another option is the patient is breathing in a shallow fashion. There may be little movement of the kidney as you scan through. And what you want to focus on on the sagittal view is making sure you evaluate the renal pelvis, where the collecting system is, and the ureter. And this allows you to evaluate for the presence or absence of hydronephrosis. But you do have to see the renal pelvis in order to evaluate the collecting system. You also have to make sure that the renal pelvis is not obscured by rib shadow, which may require you to have the patient take a breath in or breathe out in order to move the renal pelvis out from under the rib shadow. And you can see the presence of the ureter, the collecting system in the renal pelvis, and looking at the calyxes in the pyramid. You may see the renal pyramids as hypoechoic structures in the renal parenchyma. So remember, as we're scanning through an organ, we're going to scan from when the object appears in view and disappears from view, and that's the only way we know we've scanned through the entire organ. In this case, we're scanning through the kidney in a sagittal plane, and you know that there is some rib shadow. So you have to image around the rib shadow so you can evaluate the entire kidney, paying particular attention to the pelvis and the collecting system. Here you can see an image of the renal pelvis and the collecting system without dilation. Our next view is we're gonna image the kidney in a transverse plane. The indicator will be pointed anteriorly. And as we scan through the kidney, we're gonna see the kidney in a transverse plane. Once again, making sure we image through the renal pelvis so we can see the collecting system. And here you can see the renal pelvis, we see the kidney in a transverse plane, and we can see the renal parenchyma and the collecting system. The collecting system tends to be hyperechoic because of the fat that it contains, making it brighter and having a higher echogenicity. What we're looking for on a renal ultrasound is the presence or absence of hydronephrosis and the degree of hydronephrosis. Now remember, hydronephrosis is a continuum from mild to severe, 
And it can start with just dilation of the ureter or hydroureter, where we can see a dilated ureter as it enters the renal pelvis. Once again, highlighting why we need to see the pelvis for the structures of hydronephrosis. Mild hydronephrosis means that there is swelling in the renal pelvis with some dilation. And here you can see the renal pelvis is dilated at the collective system, but does not extend out to the level of the pyramids or the cortex. Once again, another example of mild hydronephrosis with some dilation of the renal pelvis in the collecting system. If you have some difficulty differentiating the collecting system versus vasculature, because both will be anechoic with hyperchoic walls, you can have the patient hold their breath to prevent flash artifact and then turn on color Doppler. Now remember, color Doppler is helpful here because as you image from a coronal plane, blood flow is directed to or away from the probe. So you can clearly see here that you can see the renal vessels that are lighting up with color Doppler whereas the collecting system with mild hydronephrosis remains anechoic without any color signal within it. Moderate hydronephrosis means that we have dilation of the renal pelvis and the calyx is starting to dilate, meaning we see dilation of the collecting system to the level of the pyramid. Here you can see an example of moderate hydronephrosis where you see dilation of the renal pelvis and dilation of the calyxes up to the level of the pyramid. It does not reach the level of the cortex, and you can see that the calyxes are separated. This is also known as a bear claw or a hand formation. As you can see, the calyxes are dilated, but the columns of Burton are still visible between them, letting you differentiate between the individual calyxes. Severe hydronephrosis means the collective system is dilated up to the level of the renal cortex. With thinning of the cortex, we've extended past the level of the pyramids, and the calyxes are starting to become confluent. Here you can see an example of severe hydronephrosis where the dilation is extending past the level of the pyramids and the calyxes are becoming confluent. Also remember that hydronephrosis is a gradation between mild, moderate, and severe. There is also limited interrater reliability. So sometimes people will call something mild and other people will call it moderate versus mild to moderate versus moderate to severe. Next, we're going to image the bladder and evaluate the presence of ureto jets. We're going to evaluate the bladder in transverse for the presence of ureto jets. You do want to view the bladder in sagittal to make sure you're identifying the bladder itself and then switch to a transverse view. Remember, the bladder will be somewhat square to rhomboid in shape. What we're looking for is the bladder in that rhomboid shape and the ureto entry into the bladder looking for the presence of the ureter jets. Now, finding where the ureter's implant may be difficult. Instead, what we're looking for is the presence of the trigone, which is easier to identify, or that little dip and depression in the posterior wall of the bladder. As we scan through here in a transverse plane, you can see the trigone. And as we freeze here, you see that depression in the posterior bladder, which is the trigone. And at that area, you'll see the ureter entry, which is visible in this view, but not always to me. You can see the trigone there and you can see the ureteral implantation sites there. As we scan through, sometimes the ureter is more prominent and there may be even some hydro ureter all the way to the distal bladder implantation. Ureteral jets will be directed from one ureteral orifice across the bladder to the contralateral side coming in at an angle, and you can see from both sides. To evaluate for the presence of ureteral jets, you're gonna use power Doppler so that you can image this low flow state, jet of urine entering from the ureter into the bladder. And you can see here, as urine enters the bladder, you see the stream on power Doppler. Make sure you have the bladder set to be anechoic so that you can easily pick up the jet at the level of the trigone and the ureteral orifice. Remember, power Doppler picks up lower flow states and is more sensitive to flow, so that's why you want to use power Doppler rather than color. And you can see the ureteral jet here coming from the left ureter crossing midline towards the right. And you can tell this is the left ureter because you have the indicator towards the patient's right and you have the non-indicator side, meaning this is the left ureter. Now, when we look for the presence of a ureteral jet, that tells us that there is incomplete obstruction because some urine is still getting past whatever was causing the obstruction, usually a stone. If we do not see a ureteral jet, that may mean there is complete obstruction, but there may also be other factors that contribute to this, such as lack of hydration or time. You can have up to 5 to 10 minutes without the presence of a ureteral jet in a non-obstructed normal patient. So presence of a jet will rule out complete obstruction. Absence of a jet does not rule in complete obstruction. If the patient has not had a bladder jet in a period of time, if the patient has not had a bladder jet for a period of time, you may have them do a Valsalva maneuver. If you have them Valsalva to prompt a ureteral jet, when they Valsalva, do not chase the bladder, leave your probe in position. So when they release the Valsalva, the bladder pops back into the position you are imaging at the level of the trigone and the ureter to evaluate if there is a jet produced or not. Generally, we are looking for indirect evidence of kidney stones and kidney stones in transit by looking for the presence of obstruction by the presence of hydronephrosis. However, we can occasionally see a stone directly. Kidney stones are going to be hyperechoic. They generally do not always have posterior acoustic shadowing as they're very small compared to gallstones and other objects. 
And you'll see here in this transverse view of the bladder, we have a kidney stone, very bright and echogenic at the level of the distal ureter, about to enter the bladder on the right. Here we have a kidney where we see some mild hydronephrosis with dilation of the renal pelvis, and we see a kidney here you have a still image where you can see mild hydronephrosis, dilation of the renal pelvis, and you can see the bright hyperechoic area at the uropelvic junction. In this case, there is some posterior acoustic shadowing because the stone is large enough to produce some. So once again, your protocol is going to image the kidney, sagittal and transverse views in an abdominal preset, indicator towards the patient's head or anterior. You're going to scan the unaffected side first. You're going to image the bladder. And while you're imaging the bladder and transverse, you may look for the presence or absence of urodo jets. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Links are in the description below.